And uh, anyways, uh, just a, a brief update. I don't know why I put 6.30 in there, but the latest thing is at 6 o'clock tomorrow night, so don't forget that. And uh, I think you saw that it said 6 or but it's actually 6. So don't forget about that. Um, anyways, uh, we're excited to get back into our series about uh, Be a Neighbor. And I think you all know, um, I don't want to belabor it, but the whole point is you you understand how important it is to have good neighbors. Um, I'll never forget, like, uh, uh, when we first moved into on Maple Road, our first house that we owned. Tiffany and I, it was a great, it was a ranch, and, and uh, it was a beautiful place. And uh, we got to know our neighbors and the great people that were around us. And there was a retired school teacher, um, co a couple of teachers uh, that were across the road. And then we had a, a retired lady that uh, uh, opposite of us. And then uh, we had a single lady that uh, shortly uh, after we moved in, she got married. And uh, it was a really cool, really cool neighborhood. And uh, Tiffany and I are, are just young adult uh, life. You know, at first house, trying to get everything settled. And one of the things that you want are people around you that are going to love you and be there when you're going through some tough times. You know, my wife and I, my parents and her parents live in Iowa, so that's uh, six hours away, and so uh, we kind of needed people around us that would be good neighbors, you know, and, uh, but we got to become good friends with everyone around us, and I'll never forget the time where I forgot Heather, um, and I, that's not a normal thing, so if you're like, you've done that before, uh, for some reason she had slipped out of the house, and, uh, and she went to our neighbor's house, and I forgot that she was around, but anyways, uh, but the, our neighbor was there to save the day and, and uh, just some great memories uh, that they always remind me about. Anyways, um, I'm just kidding. But anyways, uh, but there was one neighbor that we loved and uh, we would always, whenever there was a moment where we were like out of eggs or sugar, we always went to their house and it was like, we, we knew that we would always need something and so you didn't want to always go back into town and so we'd go over there to their house, knock on the door, they'd walk to the door with eggs or sugar, you know, it's kind of like, which one do you need? And it's like, that's a neighbor, right? It's like, they know what you need, they know you're that your, your pantry is open for them, and so you just come on in, get what you need, and then go home. So, uh, but that's a good neighbor, and being a good neighbor is a really great thing. The question is, um, are you a good neighbor to those around you? And that's the big deal. That's the big question. And how do you know if you're a good neighbor? And uh, being a good neighbor is, is huge to God, and that's why it's an important thing uh, where we read the story about the Good Samaritan. So I want you to turn there back in your Bibles, Luke chapter 10, and uh, look at verse 30, all the way down to 37. Jesus tells a story to this guy that, that had a real passion for the Word of God, the law, and uh, like, hey, who's my neighbor, was the big question. And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. So he tells him a story, and there's four principles in this story that we're kind of walking our way through um, to learn about how to be a good neighbor. But in Luke chapter 10, look at verse 30, this is what he says. Um, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, when he fell into the hands of who? Yeah, robbers. Bad day for this guy, right? You're like, man, didn't plan that, but this guy uh, ended up having to go down uh, uh, the wrong road that day. Uh, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he did what? He passed by on the other side. And uh, so to a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, he passed by on the other side too. But a Samaritan, as he was traveling, again, this is not the normal road for him, but he just happens to be traveling down this road. When he came where the man was, when he saw him, he took pity on him. And uh, it says, when he went, to, he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus says to this guy, which he's saying it to all of us, he's saying, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the answer is... The one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus says, now I want you to go and I want you to do the same thing. So if you want to be a good neighbor, uh, this is where it's at. And uh, so we've been talking about that for the Jewish person listening to the story, uh, they would, first of all, they, they need to realize that there's some fences that they're going to have to cross in order to, to, to be a neighbor to the people around them. For them, they would say, no, there's, there's certain people will be a good neighbor to you, just like you and I have our own people. We'll say, yeah, I'll be a neighbor to them. They're easy to be a neighbor to. Uh, but, you know, that kind of person, uh, you know, the sheriff's department's over there too long, or uh, there's always yelling and screaming. There's always late night things going on. I don't, I don't really want to be a neighbor to them, but but I'll be a neighbor to the people that are inside my fence. And Jesus is saying, listen, 
Um, it, you're going to have to peek over the fence and realize that God cares about everyone, and no matter what they're going through, that God wants you to be a neighbor to everyone, to be the people around you, even the people that are in, that are outside of your fence. And that's going to be a challenge. And that's the first principle: is that we need to be willing to be a neighbor to those that are outside of our fence and show that, be an encouragement, and that, and be uh, show compassion to them. So we've talked about that. Uh, the second principle we've learned also is not that not only do we are we willing, but there are moments where God, like it's like God puts us to the test. Are we really, really, you know, are you, are you really willing to to be a neighbor to the people around you? Here's a test. Let's just kind of see how you do it. And uh, and that's where we need to be willing to take a step towards them, not a step away. We need to be intentionally taking a step towards people, saying, "Listen, I'm, I see that there are people around me. Maybe there are people that I don't normally." Assume associate with or, or connect with, but God loves them, and He wants me to love them, and so I'm not going to take a step away like the priest of the Levite. I'm going to take a step where? I'm going to take a step towards. And uh, so that's part of being a good neighbor. And uh, maybe you've been challenged by this. Hopefully you've been thinking about the people in your cubicle next to you, or at school next to you, or around you, or in the workplace. Um, Dwight Kaufman gave me a call this last week. He said, Rustin, man, God was tapping me on the shoulder this last week. He was he lives in Howard. He was over at the at the BP, and uh, he was getting some gas and and uh, uh, for his van. And, and he noticed this guy was walking, and he said, um, he said the guy that was, was hot out, and he was like, oh man, the guy could probably use something. He's like, nah, no big deal. He walked inside, paid for the gas, got back into his car, and it was just like you never have those moments where it's kind of like the heat is on, like God is like pressuring even more, and he's like, no man, he's tapping him on the shoulder. He's like, you, you gotta go get him something to drink, maybe something to eat. And so he went back inside and, uh, and and got him something to drink, something. To eat. By the time he came back out, the guy was gone. And he was like, ah, well, he got a snack out of it. But anyways, the reality is, hey, A for effort, right? It's like he saw this guy, and he's like, well, I tried. And he's like, so he got back into his van, started driving. He had to go eastbound on 120. Notice there was a guy that had his uh, lawnmower tra uh, tractor uh, stuck in the ditch. And the guy was physically trying to get it out of, of the ditch. And he drove by, and he, he said, all of a sudden, he said, <laughs> no joke. I mean, the same time, right after the gas station. God taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, listen, why don't you help the guy get it out of the ditch? And he's like, ah, he's, he's got it, he's fine. And he drives a mile down the road, and guess what? The heat is what? Oh, my man, he's like, oh, no. So he said, I pulled in, I turned around, I came back around, and he said, uh, by the time I got there, he said, the guy had already gotten the lawnmower out of the ditch. And so he's like, ah. I tried. And, the, and what, what he said was this. He said, it wasn't those two things. He said, I learned something that day, even though, I mean, this is a guy that's, you know, in his 60s, and he's like, or early 60s, you probably want me to say, early 60s. And he said, he said, uh, he said, listen, he said, the one thing that I should have done was, do it now, don't wait. It's like the whole Nike adage, you know, just do it. When God is tapping you on the shoulder, just do it. And, and I get that. I'm like, there are moments where it's that first step, and it's really hard sometimes. It's like you've got places to be, people to see, things to do, and you're like, I've got enough stuff on my plate. I don't have enough time for you. And yet what God wants us to be are his good neighbors. Not just having good neighbors, but what? Being a good neighbor. And see, if you and I are willing, there are moments where God will put that to the test and say, are you really, are you really wanting to be a good neighbor? Here's your moment to be a good neighbor. But it's going to require you to take a step in that direction. Now, we're going to move into the next principle because the closer you get to your neighbor, um, it's like the higher the stakes and the greater you know, the, the, the cost to you. And this is where it's going to get a little bit harder today. And some of you are like, great, I kind of want a nice, easy sermon. It's August, you know, school just got started. It's going to get a little bit harder because the reality is, um, the closer you get to your neighbors, um, you never know what you're going to get into. And the reality is, the closer you get, uh, the greater the opportunity for blessing that you can have. And that you can have for yourself and also to be for those people. And so this morning, we're going to talk about this third principle. And, and, and it's right here in verse 34. But before we get started, I just want to stop and pray and ask God to, to just speak to us. Because I realize that, that um, this is a lot of good stuff. And, and you're all thinking about Mr. Rogers and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is, um, you know, the reality is, are we going to be a good neighbor? And, and there are moments right now that if there's ever a time where God wants the church to rise up, I love that song, build your 
kingdom to earth. You know, let the darkness fear. It's like if there's a, a moment for the church to rise, it's now. It's a moment right now for us to step up and be the neighbors that God wants us to be. So would you just pray with me for a moment? Put your hands out in front of you. And let's just invite him to speak to us and rattle the cages of our brain today. So in our hearts, let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. And thank you for the opportunity that we get to worship you and exalt you. And, and Lord, I pray that as uh, uh, we have sung these songs and, and prayed these prayers and, and, and just really thought about you, God. Now I pray that as we take a look at a peek into your word, we've been talking about being a good neighbor. And God, I know that the next step is even harder to take. And, and Lord, we thought just being willing was, was maybe a challenge. It only gets harder. But the reality of what you want to do and what you want to show through and in through us is great and glorious. And God, I pray that, that you would help us, like that song says, open our eyes to see the reality of you and what you want to do in and through our lives with, with the people around you. Every person matters. And, and God, I pray that this morning that you would, you would be breaking our heart for our neighbors. And it's not just the people that live next to us. It's the people that are next to us in the church, people that, people that are next to us in the store, people that are working side by side with us. And, and God, break our hearts for them, that we would want to be a good neighbor to them as much as we would want them to be a good neighbor to us. So God, we pray that you would teach us. We invite you into this moment. Speak to our lives, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Uh, all right, this morning I want to look at principle number three about being a good neighbor. And the reality is it's going to take you another step closer. And it's going to be actually a little bit harder. And it's just found in verse 34. Real easy. That's it. That's all we're going to look at here today. Verse 34. But the, it starts off with this. It says, he went to him. So, so here's the Samaritan. And again, for the Jewish person, they're already kind of ticked off with Jesus because the, the Samaritan's the hero of the story. But Jesus busts the system where he's saying everybody that understands in the Jewish community, that understands the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship, they've been busted. The people that should have known better to be a neighbor totally are busted. But here's the Samaritan. And he's going to be a hero, and he's going to be the, the hero of the day. And he decides, he sees this guy, and he sees him on the side of the road. And it says, he went to him. Now, there's a lot of things that happen in that moment when you're on the road, and you see a neighbor going through whatever it is that they're going through. You don't know what it is that they're going through, but you know that maybe something you need, they need something right now. The, the going to them is going to, there's a lot of things that's going to happen in, in your brain. And uh, the reality is this. You may be thinking, as you take that step towards, as you go to him, you're thinking, why is he there on the side of the road? What's the story? What's going on in their lives? And the thing is, when you have neighbors, do they just automatically tell you what's going on? Some may need to know, and you're like, didn't need to know that, right? But some of them are like, they, you don't know. You have no idea. Some of you have read stories, you're going, I had no idea that was even going on in their home. You're like, I had no idea. You're like, what's the story? See, going to them, this is, this is, it's even, your, your legs are going to get a little bit heavier as you start getting closer because there's questions that need to be answered in your brain. You're like, why is that guy on the side of the road? Well, first of all, why is he on the side of the road? And why is he naked? And why is he all busted up? Now, you and I have a privilege that we get to read the story. Then we get to get a peek inside of this guy's story. And you and I know, man, it's terrible what this guy went through. This guy was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he got, he got busted up by some robbers, some thieves. He didn't see it coming, and it wasn't just one guy on one guy, it's multiple people on one. So this guy gets all of his clothes stolen, and he gets busted up, and he's laying half dead. As, as Jesus said, he's half dead on the side of the road. And again, I just want to reiterate, I don't know what that looks like. I mean, I can maybe guess what that looks like, but I have no idea what that looks like. But the closer you get into a situation, when he went to him, there's a lot going on. He's thinking, why is he there? He may be even thinking to himself, hey, listen, is he, is like, is this the right place? I mean, like, could I be putting myself in a position that could potentially hurt me? I mean, hello. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like, do I really want to get into somebody else's business? Do I really want to get into their story? Because if somebody's around the corner and I didn't know they were coming, I could be potentially hurting myself. But God's the one that tapped me on the shoulder, and I see this person. He needs a neighbor to come around him. So the closer I get to him, I'm thinking, I have no idea what's going on. I don't know why he's laying there, half dead, naked, on the side of the road. Now pause there. Remember, this is a busy road. Now maybe not Chicago-style road, but this is a busy kind of road. People normally traveled on this road. And guess what? Nobody else is stuck. 
So you may be also looking around going, um, does anybody notice that like naked guy that's laying on the side of the road that's like half dead? Uh, just curious. Am, am I seeing things or does anybody else see this? See, we have a, a lot of us have this ability to kind of put the blinders on in life. Have you ever done that before? It's like you just, listen, I'm just going to put my head down. I'm going to keep my, my face in my phone. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close off my ears. I don't really want to know because if I know, it might affect me. And if it affects me, I might have to what? I might have to do something. I'm about to do something. See, all of this stuff gets a little bit harder. You thought first week and second week were easy. Man, it's going to get harder. See, being a good neighbor is not something that you, it's not a spectator sport. Because there are moments when you're going to need somebody to step in for you. So when it says this, it says, he went to him. He's on his way. Now, he's going to go see him, and he's going to find this guy laying side of the road, naked and busted up. He has no idea what he's going to find. He's going to all of a sudden, quickly, in his brain, three, two things are going to happen. He's going to assess the needs, and he's going to take stock of his resources. And you do the same thing. You're going to assess the needs, and you're going to take stock of the resources. You're going to say, what is going on? What happened? Why is this guy here? And what does this guy need? But before you even get to that spot, there's something that goes off in your brain that says, listen, maybe I can't help him. What if I don't have enough ability or resources to be able to help him? I heard this quote the other day, and I don't know who... Who wrote it? I don't know who said it, so let's just say you did, okay? Uh, this is what it says. Because we can't do everything, this doesn't mean that we can't do something. That's good. See, we get this idea that, listen, um, I, I get a little bit panicked and I'm not really too sure. Can I really help out? I don't know. I can't do everything. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a superstar in every area, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not medical. I'm not, I'm not financial. I'm not all that stuff. See, all of those things are like deterrents for us to take the step closer. You may want to take a step, but as soon as you start taking steps, you start realizing that the stakes get a little bit higher. And so the reality is, the closer I get, uh, the reality is, I may not be able to fix everything or do everything, but I can do something. And so can you. So as he gets down on his knees and he starts to evaluate the situation, he finds out, finds out that this guy is wounded and in need of urgent care. Look at it with me. It says this. He went to him, and then what did he do for him? It says he bandaged his what? He bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Now listen, I mean, this is one of those situations where you look at people, I don't know what a half-dead guy looks like, but he's been busted up. I've seen MMA a little bit. I've seen guys with busted nose and, and fractured stern, all that stuff. You know, their faces are, you know, their eyes are, you know, swollen shut, and, and you know, they're just trying to see blood's coming out of their nose and, and maybe some, some split skin and stuff like that. I don't know. I'm not sure if you can handle that kind of stuff. I don't like that stuff. I wasn't a doctor for a reason. You know, I don't want to deal with that stuff. I mean, like, just if you got a problem, go find your mom, right? And uh, a lot of you are like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And uh, it's like, it, it makes me sick to my stomach the more I look at it. Some of you are like, dude, muscle up. And I'm like, I just don't like it. I don't, I don't like looking at that stuff. This guy does not know what he's going to get into, but in that moment, he's going to have to assess the urgent needs. So as he sits down, he sees this guy, looks at this guy, and realizes the guy's breathing. And, uh, but he is like half dead. I mean, that's all it says. Jesus says the guy is half dead. So he realizes this guy's got some wounds and he's going to need some, some immediate, urgent, you know, care. So he reaches into the guy's bag and, and, and all he's got is what he's got. And some of you have been traveling before, you've gone on hikes before, and you realize when you've gone on a journey, you've got things that you know that you need for yourself. If anything ever happens, you've got stuff to take care of yourself. Maybe, maybe, if you really think things through. Now, some of you, if you're going with your family, you're thinking, listen, I I've got enough for me and my family, but, you know, if it's somebody else, they're kind of on their own. So this guy reaches into his bag, takes an assessment of what are the resources that I've got, realizes that this guy's got some wounds. And what he does is he pulls out his wine, and he uses the wine for what reason? What's he do with the wine? Why does he pour wine on, on, on these wounds? Yeah, kind of as a, as a disaffected, kind of a clean. So he sees these wounds. I mean, so there's, there's like some serious stuff going on. I don't know what it's like to be beat up by, by a bunch of robbers. I've uh, never experienced that before. So when I do, I'll let you know. But I, I don't know what kind of lacerations this guy is dealing with. But he puts the oil on his wounds. And then he takes olive oil, and he pours the olive oil over the wounds, and then he bandages the wounds. 
I didn't know why they do olive oil. And uh, for, for the Jewish people, olive oil was a normal commodity for them, but they also used it for the, in, in, like healing properties. And I never really understood. It was also used for, it would like, they would, they would clean the wound and put oil on it, bandage it, and it was just used for like, um, like uh, soothing. Uh, but also it had some healing properties. And, uh, and I don't know, what, at what point did somebody say, instead of say, rub some dirt in it, they said, rub some olive oil in it, right? It's like, I don't know when that happened, but I found this interesting. There was, a, just as a side note, some of you like this kind of stuff. Um, a study published in the journal Burns looked into the effect of taking olive oil orally. Okay, you're fascinated already, I can tell. And, and on, a, on a body's ability to recover from a burn-related wound, it involved 100 patients at, the, at the, a mean age of 33 uh, years, all of whom had deep second-degree burns that covered 10 to 20 percent of total body surface area. Now, some were directed to implement olive oil into their diet, while the control group used sunflower oil. Now, get this. The participants were evaluated on a daily basis to check for wound infection, sepsis, and the healing rate of grafted skin. The results show that those who took olive oil had significantly shorter duration of wound healing and had shorter hospital stays compared to the uh, control group. As such, the researchers concluded that an oral diet of olive oil in burn victims may accelerate the recovery process and reduce the duration of hospitalization. So you need to go buy some olive oil, right? So instead of telling your kids to rub some dirt in it, just rub some olive oil in it, man. It's supposed to heal up a little bit. So I don't know at what point they decided that olive oil was supposed to help, but it did. And they, they noticed that it actually helped uh, wounds to heal a little bit better. But not just that, it would, it would be a little bit of the kind of the, the motherly touch, the love that uh, you could give to a person and helping to, to prepare them. So, so this guy gets this guy settled. Okay, I gotta keep rolling because I'm running out of time. But I want you to get this. So the guy sees his urgent needs and says, this guy's wounded, this guy's half dead. I need to get this guy stable. That's what I gotta do. And you never know what you're gonna get into, but this guy is in. He's in and, uh, up to uh, both elbows, ready to go to take care of this guy. So he gets him stable, right? That's where it goes. He just uses what resources he has and gets this guy stable. But it doesn't end there. And then he goes on, look at verse, look at the verse 34. It says, then he put the man on whose donkey? Look at it with me. On whose donkey? On, on the Samaritan's donkey. Now that's an interesting, it, it's kind of a joke for them because they would have understood the guy The guy would have had his car stolen, right? I mean, the, the, the thieves would have just taken his clothes, they would have taken everything that he had. So they're like, what other donkey would he have had? Would he have just said, hey, you, here, give me your donkey and throw the guy? No, he would have put him on his own donkey. The idea is, listen, when you are helping people, it's not just going to be one of those things that's like, hey, listen, be, be fed, be warmed, you know, enjoy life, uh, I'll, I'll see you later. Sometimes it's a cost to us personally. And it gets a little bit scary when we start having to lend our stuff out to help meet somebody's needs. See, because we live with, hey, this is my stuff. I mean, what's the, what's the one word that little kids learn? I mean, they learned it from, from somebody. Uh, I'm sure, it wasn't me. I'm sure it wasn't me. My kids learned this word from somebody. What's that word when they learn when they're little kids? It's a very special word, right? It, mine. It's like, no, not yours. It's mine. See, we've grown up with this idea that it's mine. And the reality is, it's not mine, it's his. And he's given it to me for my, at, at my disposal to be able to help minister to the people around me. That's why he says stuff like, hey, listen, if somebody asks to borrow something, let them have it, right? It's like, don't ask for it, just let them have it. This is, we're, we're sharing, we're working together, we're caring for each other. That's the kind of neighboring that we're to be. But we're like, no, it's not yours, it's mine. And see, th this whole idea of saying, listen, sometimes it's going to cost us something. But so here, he says, okay, not only does he get the guy stable, but now he's going to deal with his short-term needs. And he's saying, listen, I need to get this guy some help. So what does he do? He puts him on his donkey. Look at it with me. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and then he took him somewhere. Where did he take him? He took him to the local hotel. I mean, they're not everywhere. They're usually in town. So he's going to have to travel back somewhere, either forward to Jericho or back to Jerusalem, to find a place for him to stay. Wherever he is on the journey, it's going to require that all of a sudden, the people that he needed to see, the places that he needed to be, is going to be put on hold. And he's going to have to give this guy some, 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 some help. He's going to get this guy some, some a roof over his head, a, a, a pillow for under, uh, 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 under his head. And so this guy's going to get all of a sudden now, 
It's like, I've got to put everything on hold so I can not only just get this guy stable, because we're really good at making triage in the situation like, hey, let's just get this guy stable so that I can get back on my way. But sometimes it just doesn't go that way, does it? All of a sudden, I'm here a little bit longer, and I'm caring for somebody a little bit deeper because they have deeper needs than just the urgent needs. Now they have some short-term needs. So this guy needs a hotel. For them, it would have been like the local hospital. For them, that's how they would have cared for each other. And it says, this is what the guy did. He, put him, he took him to an inn. So he put everything on hold and said, this guy needs help. And then it says, not only did he take him to an inn, but it says the last phrase, what does it say? And he, and he did what? And he took care of him. I mean, this guy spent the night making sure that this guy was going to survive the night. This guy took a moment and said, listen, I'm going to put everything on hold so I can make sure that this guy lives. Because this guy matters. Now remember, he's a Samaritan. He doesn't even know this guy. And the, and the people are listening to him going, why would, why would he do that? He doesn't even know him. Why would he stop what he's doing? Why would he even take a step closer? Yeah, he's, he's, it's a, he's a Jew. It should have been us, not the Samaritan. The, the unlikely person is the one that stopped. The unlikely person is the one that saw. The unlikely person is the one that actually went over and said, forget the, the risk of it all. This guy needs my help. Because that's what it means to be a neighbor. It's like, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, when you are. It, it, it matters that you matter to God. And no matter what you're going through, there is something inside of us that should say, you matter so much to God, even though I don't know you, even though I don't know what I'm getting into, you need somebody to help. You need somebody to help you. And that person is going to be me. So they put that time on hold, and they say, listen, I'm going to watch you and care for you through the night. Now it goes on from there to some long-term needs, and we're going to talk about that next week. But the reality is this. When you start taking steps closer to people, and you start assessing their needs, you start realizing, hey, listen, do I really want to get into the middle of this? And God is saying, absolutely. Because God got into the middle of our story. See, the reality is you and I are that broken person that's laying on the side of the road half dead. And God said, he's not going to walk by. He can't walk by. He jumped the fence and came here and said, I'm going to get into the story of your life. And I'm going to meet your needs. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 34. That the Lord is close to the broken heart. He is close to the broken heart. And there are moments when you're going to find yourself broken. And aren't you grateful that God doesn't say, you know what, listen, I've, I've got a 3 o'clock appointment. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll get back with you. God puts life on hold. He says, I will be with you. I mean, I don't have to go through scripture after scripture, but that's the kind of neighbor that God is. And that's the kind of neighbor of what he's saying that he wants us to be. That he wants us to stop and just try to discover, to take it, to intentionally, not just take a step, but say, listen, I'm going to risk it. And I know that I don't know what I'm getting into here. And I don't know how deep this could potentially go. But this person needs my help. Because who knows? I may be that person someday hoping that they will say, this person needs I need their help. And I want to be that kind of neighbor. And he said, try to discover, this is that principle number three, is that you and I, this idea of trying to discover the needs of those, the urgent needs of those around us, and then do whatever we can after that. You know, some of us, we get so worried because we can't do everything, it doesn't mean that we can't do something. And this is the reality of what God wants us to be as a neighbor. Now, uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about our Mother's Day uh, project. Every Mother's Day we do this uh, opportunity, this uh, experience where we want to help single moms and, and single women um, and come around them and be a neighbor to them, really. And uh, there are moments where we, we can get into people's lives and say, man, there, there are needs that they have and, and it's great to know that somebody is around that can be there for them so that they don't feel like they're alone. And we've been doing this for a number of years since I've been here, and I love it every Mother's Day. Because we get a chance to be able to just bless some, some moms. And so last Mother's Day, I actually nominated some moms, and, and the outreach committee came together, and they, they have these four ladies that, uh, that we want to encourage and just say, Look, you, you matter to God. And they have needs. And then we assess, what, what can we do? And then what can we do together? So here's their stories, and I want you to hear. This is, these are their stories about 
um, uh, the people that we want to encourage uh, this year and bless with and honor of Mother's Day. So, would you watch this? Hi. Absolutely. See, these are folks that, um, in the story of their lives, they may be wondering, like, they may not be like that guy that's laying on the side of the road, and, but they're going through stuff. And they're just wondering, God, where are you? And uh, like the one lady saying, you know, it's like, and I, and I've got this bill, and I'm just trying to keep making ends meet, and I'm just trying to keep things going. And God, where are you? And all of a sudden, it's like somebody was tapped on the shoulder to nominate this girl so that Sarah could call her and say, Hey, listen. And all of a sudden, she's going, Are you kidding me? Like, like, is this the? Did you call the right person? I mean, that, those are those moments where it's like we get to see God show up and show off and show His glory, and because God tapped her on the shoulder and said, Listen, I know you may not know what's going on in their story. You may not know what's going on. Their lives. And, and you know what? It's a lot going on there. But understand this. I want to show them that they matter to me. And I want to do it through you. So you get the opportunity to be a neighbor to that person and be the hands and feet of Jesus and to show his heart and how desperately he loves them. See, the guy that was laying on the side of the road, you know, he's still, in, he's like incoherent. I, we don't even know if he's like aware of what's going on. This guy is just taking care of them. And, and, and it's because he is at the mercy of somebody else saying, I need a neighbor. I need somebody who will love me and be compassionate towards me and help me through this terrible time that I'm in. And see, God says, I want to tap you on the shoulder and I want to use you. And see, that's what it means to be a neighbor. And so he's inviting us to experience that and be a neighbor. We're assessing the need, but then we're going to take stock of our resources. And we talked about with our outreach committee and our, our deacons. And what we want to do is this. Next week, we're going to have offering plates in the back after the service. And what we're asking is this. We're just asking if every family would give one gift, one gift, if every family would give one gift to their family. And so, like, for me, for my wife and I and our four kids, for just our family, they're asking one gift from each family. And it is $39.99. No, just kidding. $40. That's all we're asking. $40. One family. And some of you are like, listen, forty dollars. That's like a that's like a huge sacrifice for some of you. You'd be like, listen, that's like we 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 only there's that's forty dollars. I know we can use and and it's like, listen, that's going to be a sacrifice. And part of being a neighbor is sacrificial. It's like, again, yeah, it's getting on our donkey and it's like getting our resources, dipping into our resources to help each other out. So this is an opportunity for you to say, listen, I'm going to give. It may be a sacrifice for some of you. For others of you, you're like, listen, forty bucks for a family. That's like no big deal. And that's great. God's blessed you. You have resources. We, you know, maybe you want to get more. You can get more. But we're not asking that you have to. All we're saying is, if we want, if every family would give forty dollars at the end of the service, you, you, we can meet these needs, and these ladies can be blessed and encouraged and know that God, that they matter to God, and that God wants to bless and encourage them along the journey. Hello, is that great stuff? I love that because that's what it means to be a neighbor. Because that is what He's done for us. Hey, listen, we're going to close in word prayer, and I don't know about you, but some of you need a neighbor to come around you. And there might be times where you need somebody to pray for you. We've got some folks that are going to come. They're going to stand right up here. And uh, they want to pray for you. They've got things that they know that you've got things going on in your lives. And they just want to pray for you and encourage you and let you know that you matter to God. You matter to them. And no matter what you're going through, they want to lift it up to the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords uh, on your behalf. So you come and, and pray with them. They want to pray with you and encourage you. Maybe there's some things going on in your heart. Maybe God is, maybe God has already been tapping you on the shoulder. And again, you're like going, Lord, it's hard. I want good neighbors, but what about me? How am I doing? Am I a good neighbor? He's saying, here's how you could go if you're being a good neighbor. And so why don't you stand for closing prayer and uh, let's pray together. God, thank you for this morning. We are just so grateful that we can come and, and study from your word. And, and this one verse, verse 34, God, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff that we've thought about and dealt with in our own lives and the people that we see. And God, I pray that you would help us not to be afraid, but to look at the situations around us and say, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're going through what they're going through, but they matter to you. And God, I pray that you would break our hearts for people. That the people around us, that, that we're not kind of trying to reason out in our brains, well, if you wouldn't have done this, or if you wouldn't have done that, but just to step back and say, you know what, we've all made some mistakes. But the reality is that they are where they are. And that they matter to you. And God, I pray that as we take steps closer and closer to our neighbors, it's going to cost something from us. And, and it's not that we had planned these things. These are moments in life that they come our way. And then, God, you tap us on the shoulder. You say, hey, listen, I want to show that person they matter. And I want to use you to do that. 
And God, I pray that you would help us to be open. Not just be willing, not just be willing to take one step, but as we get closer, up close and personal, that we do our best just to be 30s as best as we can with only what we have. And I pray, God, that you would use it for your glory and that you would use it to let them, those people know that they matter to you. God, I pray this morning that if there's anyone in this room that is that, that, you know, we're that broken people on the side of the road. If we've never surrendered our life to you, Jesus, we are in desperate need of, of your compassion. And so, God, you, you've come. You've come to this place. You've died on the cross. You've rose again so that if we would trust in you, we could know your love firsthand. And so, God, I pray if there's anyone in this room that has never surrendered their lives to Jesus, put that stake in the ground say, no more, I'm not living for myself, I'm living for you, Jesus. I want you to save me and rescue me. If that's you, listen, my friend, just, just whisper this prayer, just say, Jesus, save me, rescue me, and he will. He'll be your Lord, he'll be your Savior, he'll be your friend, and he will walk this journey with you. And God, for the rest of us that know what it's like to have you as a friend, a forever friend, I pray, God, that you would help us to learn from you and listen how to be a neighbor and follow your advice. We love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. These folks are here. They want to pray with you. You come. Have a great day. Go be a neighbor.